welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you're listening to a weekly podcast about books and life. Not necessarily in that order. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show on iTunes, or use our RSS feed with your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter, Instagram, and SoundCloud at vmspod, at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please go to the iTunes store, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and review for us. Now, you can support the Virtual Memories Show and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash vmspod and set up your level of support. Every week, you'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. <sighs> okay, let's get right to it. Uh, it is the first anniversary of the 2016 presidential election, and while I do have a whole bunch of episodes in the can, I cannot think of a better guest for that occasion than Martin Rosen. Martin's main editorial cartooning gig is at The Guardian in the UK, and if you haven't seen his work... Um, it is viciously satirical in the best possible way. In addition to political comics, Martin's also made comic adaptations of several literary works. Uh, the Wasteland by Elliot, Tristram Shandy, Gulliver's Travels. And when I got to his studio, uh, he showed me a page from his newest adaptation, The Communist Manifesto. So what I'm saying is, Martin's work is right up my alley, and it was a goddamn blast to, to spend an hour with him. Um, so we're going to dive right into it. Uh, caveats for this one. We were in a studio. There was no table, so it's a handheld mic, a little bit wonky. Uh, his blind, deaf, ill-tempered dog was in his lap for most of the time. It snores at one point. You'll hear it. Um, also, there's a moment when I refer to George Packer and Philip Roth in an anecdote. I meant George Steiner. Now, here's Martin's bio, adapted from the site of his speaking agency, Lakin McCarthy. Martin Rosen is a multi-award winning cartoonist, writer, and broadcaster. His work is published in The Guardian, The Daily Mirror, The Independent on Sunday, The Morning Star, and has appeared in more or less every other publication you can think of, apart from The Sun. He has produced comic book adaptations of T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, Lauren Stern's The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy, Gentleman, and Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels. His other books include Giving Offense, Fuck, The Human Odyssey, and The Dog Allusion, Gods, Pets, and How to Be Human, an irrational atheist response to Richard Dawkins. His 2006 memoir, Stuff, about cleaning out his late parents' house and his own adoption, was nominated for the Samuel Johnson Prize for nonfiction. Martin is the former chair of the British Cartoonists Association and a former vice president of the Zoological Society of London. He was appointed Cartoonist Laureate of London when Ken Livingstone was mayor. For some reason, that didn't continue under Boris Johnson. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Martin Rosen. U.S. or U.K., who's more fucked? Uh, well, I think it sort of oscillates between the two. Um, every year I, I give a talk to a bunch of media students from Michigan, who come over here for about three weeks, and I'm the sort of light relief either at the beginning or the end when I hmm. give them a quick run through the uh, 35,000 years of visual satire. Yeah. And uh, we uh, we just had our election, and I spoke to them and I said, you know, we were the laughing stock of the world after we had Brexit, but then you became the laughing stock <laughs> of the world when you elected Trump. <laughs> but look at our election. It's us again. So, you know, relax. We're really neck and neck on <laughs> yeah, this? Yeah, okay. we're neck and neck on this. Because <laughs> uh, I wonder, I, I recorded with Ann Telness a couple of weeks oh, yeah, ago, yeah. and she admitted that she had a um, 
some regret for how vitriolic she was during the Bush Cheney years now, because it's almost a girl who cried wolf vibe yeah. that, wow, I may have shot all my ammunition then, not realizing it can only it, get worse. It can only get worse. Well, you see, this is the um, something that people have been saying to me over and over again for the last sort of 18 months. God, everything's terrible, isn't it? But you must be having fun. And I was saying, well, you know, I'm a satirist because I'm outraged by things, but I'm, uh, you know, I'm also a citizen. And yeah. I'd like to be redundant. I'd like to just be drawing pictures of kittens and teacups and things like that. Uh, you know, best possible scenario. Right. Uh, but, um, you know, it's always been the case that satire has been scratching its balls in bed. And satire does have balls because it is a male construct, mm -hmm. sadly. Uh, and um, reality's gone five times around the world as the other side of satire's bed pissing in satire's slippers. And so it's always been terrible. It always will be terrible. That's why we have satire in the first place, to make it bearably terrible. And I thought, OK, you can't get much more ridiculous than Brexit. Well, you've got Trump is more ridiculous than Brexit. Well, how do you satirise Trump? And, of course, the wonderful thing about Trump, like the Brexiteers, is that they are beyond anything that Swift could have made up but they can't take a joke against themselves. Yeah. And it was wonderful in, uh, in Private Eye, you know, the British satirical magazine, uh, all these harumphing old xenophobes were saying, you know, why are you taking the piss out of us? Why, why aren't you attacking the rim owners, the appalling EU? And Ian Hislop quite rightly said, well, because you won. Yeah. That's why we're attacking, <laughs> because you, 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 won. Down. you won. Yeah. And for somebody to become president of the United States of America who, despite all the appearances of having a skin about 12 inches thick, is so thin-skinned and is so desperately yearning for the good opinions of everybody around him and has exposed himself as the biggest cunt who ever lived. And he will go down in history as the worst president of the United States of America ever, if it survives, if it has any future history. And he's done it because he's surrounded by basically incompetent clowns. I keep on shouting at the radio and shouting at newspapers, you know, you whining fascist clowns. If they were any good, they wouldn't be in this position. If um, Steve Bannon wasn't a whining fascist clown, he would have got a better front man. <laughs> yeah. As it is, he got a, a sort of 70-year-old toddler who screams and screams until he's sick, who, who probably doesn't even understand what other people are. It's probably that level of autism involved and you know the nazis got away with having a ridiculous man who looked like charlie chaplin because they were defying you to laugh at them but if you laugh at them, they kill you and that's how totalitarianism always works yeah. works religiously secularly we are going to be so ridiculous but we defy you to laugh yes at and orwell brings that yeah, up in yeah, England exactly England. exactly yeah, uh, yeah. every joke is a little revolution um and you know in, in the case of both brexit and trump they're too dumb to even work that out <laughs> Yeah. They are so desperately stupid. It is beyond belief. And, of course, satire becomes slightly difficult because you can kick these people in the balls forever and they think you're being witty. That's what stuff. I'm wondering. How does it change your job? Um, I mean, well, I, you know, we have the, the joke the, about the, how it gives you okay, material okay. every day, yeah, but yeah, we know yeah. that's, that's actually... But you see, yeah. I, I realised about 20 years ago uh, what the nature of my job was. Uh, I used to think, you know, in, in the rather pretentious way that satirists do, that it's uh, corrective surgery, albeit wielded with a cudgel rather than a scalpel. And in fact, it's not about that at all. It's not about making the subjects or the victims of your satire better people by pointing out their idiocies. It's to make us feel better about them. Mm -hmm. That's the purpose of it. It's, it's to make us laugh or to empower us to have permission to laugh and laughter is a wonderful thing. That's why we have it. It's an evolutionary survival tool. Otherwise, we go insane with horror at the prospect of our own deaths, as well as the fact that we shit every day and we're surrounded by idiots. And when we laugh, we release these lovely endorphins and just make us feel better. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's about. So, you know, we are licensed to laugh at these imbeciles in charge. And it's not going to stop them being in charge. They'll always be in charge, but it just makes us feel slightly better. And it stops them, to a large extent, being treated by everybody as if they're gods, which is what they want. I do have to wonder, I, I, in my day job, um, pharmaceutical industry related, we had two industry events in the last year where the keynote speaker was David Cameron. These are domestic U.S. Mm. events. And I, I didn't attend either one because I, I just sat back wondering, what on earth would that man have to say as far as advice goes beyond don't call a vote when you don't know what the, <laughs> <laughs> the response is going to be? Uh, but in, in your experience, again, when you... 
as much as you would ridicule, you know, the previous mm. regime's administrations, did you ever think it'll get this bad or that, you know, it can get worse from where we are now? Well, I think you should always work on the basis that it will always get worse yeah. before it gets better. Yeah. Then it will get worse again. Right. Um, I mean, this is, this is, it, I mean, it's always heartening. I, I thought Cameron's government was the worst government of my lifetime. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And uh, yeah. I thought Iraq was the worst policy catastrophe of my lifetime. And I was wrong. And it's good to know that they are even stupider than you think, because if they're that <laughs> stupid, you can work on the basis that one day they'll forget how to get out of the door. They'll just be stuck inside and then they'll leave us alone because they are so catastrophically dim. Mm -hmm. And of course, you're not allowed to say that because it means you're an elitist. Uh, well, you know, I spent a long time doing the sneering metropolitan elite exams to get to this position. Yeah. And I'm not going to have a bunch of knuckle scraping clowns who are all, weirdly enough, on the side of the very rich. Uh, you know, so you have Nigel Farage saying he's leading an anti-elitist anti revolution, goes and gets himself photographed next to an orange man in a golden tower. <laughs> I mean, <it's>, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, again, irony is dead because they don't, they don't get it because they're too thick. Mm. Um, but of course, the rest of us bide our time until they, you know, do something like decide to brush their teeth by plugging their toothbrush into the mains or whatever, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Did you face any any well libel laws being much uh, uh, stricter here in the UK than back in the US? Do you face uh, yeah, any degree libel? Libel is interesting. Um, I was talking about this to somebody else the other day. Uh, that cartoonists in this country are, are weirdly immune to the libel laws yeah. in practice, not in theory, but in practice. Uh, probably because uniquely amongst the nations of the world, we have had a history of visual satire going back to 1695. True. And we've been part of the political conversation for that long. And a, a sort of mainstream part of the conversation. So, mm. you know, in Gilray's key clientele were the people he was attacking because it was part of the game. If you couldn't take the, the satire, you weren't up to the statesmanship, as it were. Um, so periodically, somebody will sue a cartoonist for libel, never a politician. And a politician would never do that because they realise it's completely imbecilic. It's just going to drag them back into the yeah, spotlight. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. But it's usually a businessman. Mm -hmm. um, and it usually drags on for a bit until they finally heed wider, wiser counsel and mm -hmm. withdraw the action. So the last time this happened was um, Steve Bell, strip in the, if, if strip in the Guardian. Uh, there's a Scottish businessman uh, who's an evangelical Christian called Brian Souter, who runs Stagecoach Transport Company. They run buses and trains. And uh, about 12 years ago, he organised with Cardinal Winning, the Cardinal Archbishop of Glasgow, a private referendum against the repealing of Clause 28 in the Scottish Parliament. Now, Clause 28 was a pernicious piece of homophobic legislation introduced under Thatcher, saying you weren't allowed to teach in schools, in state schools, uh, the idea of the gay lifestyle as a pretended form of family life. That was actually the, the phrase used. And it was vile and pernicious. It's one of the good things Labour did was to get rid of this trash. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, Steve did a cartoon about winning and Brian Souter. Well, it was a week's worth of strips, and Souter sued. I originally thought he was suing over the final frame in the series, which was winning and Souter being sodomised in the deepest pit of hell by the great Lord Satan. <laughs> but, in fact, that was not the actionable... Really? Image. The actual image was Souter driving his bus, saying, I'd rather my son was a papist than a poof. Yeah. And so he sued Steve and The Guardian in the English courts in London. And libel actions in this country, in England, under English law, are heard by a jury. And so he was advised that he might lose. So he transferred it to the Scottish jurisdiction, where they have a different legal system, where there was no chance of a jury trial, but he'd have much lower damages. And this was going on for months and months and months. And Steve was under a terrible amount of pressure over this. And I, in my role as the chairman of the British Cartoonists Association, was just on the point of getting as many cartoonists as I possibly could in a public space to redraw the offending frame in their own style yeah. in the kind of Spartacus, Spartacus defence. <laughs> See if yeah. he'd sue all of us. When he withdrew, because he knew that he was exposing himself to far greater ridicule and contempt. Yeah. Then he'd just been take the joke the and yes. let it go. Yeah, let yeah. it go. Yeah, Barry Blitt was on last week, and and it was the same thing. Uh, uh, Lord Black sued him in Canada oh, yeah, yeah. over uh, um, Lord Black in Hell, yeah. which wasn't Barry's idea, just a commission, but yeah, you know yeah. enough to to you know cause some sleepless nights as, yeah. as those things go. Um, artist or journalist? 
journalist. Yeah. Is it ever a, a hemming and hawing between the two, or do you always see this as part uh, of a journalistic all, 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 tradition? Always a journalist. I, I, st- I first started calling myself a visual journalist rather than any kind of artist um, uh, quite a long time ago to disassociate myself from the charlatans <laughs> emerging, <laughs> emerging from Goldsmiths College, which is about a mile and a half from here, and which I'm an honorary fellow, wonderful place. Art school? No. Oh, what is it? Yeah, I never went cool. to art school. Read. Oh, no, I mean Goldsmiths. Oh, Goldsmiths, yes. It's yeah. a famous art school. Okay. It produced yeah. Damien Hirst. Because I'm, people. I'm yeah. you know, yeah. some provincial American. So. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it produced, uh, it yeah. produced uh, Damien Hirst and many other people like that. Oh, that's something to be proud of. And, uh, and <laughs> yeah. you know, there's a lot of people going around. I mean, the art market in this country is dominated by Charles Saatchi, who's a man from advertising. Yeah. Um, sorry, my dog is just coughing here. <laughs> That's, that's okay. Nice. So that's a good noise for a satirist. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that wasn't me. That was the dog. Um, and um, I, world, just, I, just, yeah. I just wanted to disassociate myself from these artists. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's very interesting that um, there is a sort of weird hierarchy. I'm constantly trying to work out how this works. Uh, but a few years ago, there was an exhibition of Francis Bacon uh, in the Tate Gallery. And I was on the radio, on a radio arts programme, going around with Maggie Hambling, who's a sort of very famous sculptress and painter. And there was a very early Bacon painting of a baboon, which I'd never seen before. And I was blown away by this image, the sparsity of paint, and the, the fact that he caught the baboonness of this baboon. And I said, look, this is absolutely incredible. This is a wonderful painting I've never seen before. I mean, it is caricaturally great because he has caught the innate baboonness of the baboon, at which point Maggie Hamley narrowed her eyes and said, how dare you call Francis Bacon a caricaturist? Take it back at once. I thought, what's your problem? And then I sort of worked out in this hierarchy I've been aware of for, for decades that artists, in inverted commas, view illustrators, and particularly cartoonists, with a kind of contempt because it's all they've got. Because we get paid regularly. Yeah. And quite often we get paid twice because we get paid for the original image and we sell the original mm-hmm. artwork. Um, and, and people actually see your work. And, people, and our work is seen by hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. And so the only thing they've got to maintain their status is their contempt for us, which is fine by me. But, <laughs> but it's just a bit weird. But th- th- there are definitely two kinds of cartoonists. There are those cartoonists who think they're artists who are rather miserable um, Nobody driven people. Me, well, no, it's because they, they don't afford. They, they don't command enough money for their originals. Yeah. yeah. Um, whereas a cartoonist like me, I'm actually sort of rather a happy person, rather content with my lot, rather you know, jolly in a way, uh, because I think you know, well, I've got away with selling that for this amount of money. That's okay. I'm just a hack, you know. Yeah. Do you do commissions also? I mean, um, uh, commissions not for publication. Uh, I do a lot of um, sort of cards and things for people's leaving presents and things like that yeah i've just done two this week in fact so. yeah i just wasn't sure if that's a you know yeah. somebody says you know i need martin to do this and and you oh know, yeah no yeah. i'll t- i mean there, yeah. there are there are very few commissions i turn down the only reason i usually turn things down is because i haven't got time yeah but yeah um <clears throat> any regret about not getting art training no. I, from what i gather you're you're self-taught from I'm self- no, no, I, I, <clears throat> it's much much more fun making it up as i go along yeah <clears throat> there, <clears throat> excuse me there, there are certain techniques which I um, you know, I sort of discover for myself, yeah. and thought, wow, if you do that like that, this yeah. is what happens. That's amazing, you know. Um, and other- otherwise, it actually gets terribly boring. Because <laughs> yeah, I, I recorded with John Cuneo a couple of months ago, yeah. and that was he's got a lot of anxiety. Uh, but his his whole thing was, if I'd only gone to art school, I would have developed all these techniques, and I wouldn't have had to reteach myself all this stuff. And he, he's always felt like he's behind all of his peers, even though they see him as as yeah. you know an amazing talent uh he nonetheless thinks that's the thing that's holding him back from you know where he could have gone in his career so he's the only guy you know who feels that way everybody else's art school eh, not so much well our, but, our daughter know. went to the slade um you mm. know one of the supposedly one of the greatest art schools in the world which i'm sure it is and she was there for five four years doing fine art at the end of it i said um so what's four years fine art course at the slade taught you she said it's taught me i've just been surrounded for the last four years by the most pretentious people on the planet i said well that's a lesson worth learning yeah <laughs> you probably could have figured it out quicker than that but yeah, you know yeah. i had that with uh, uh george lois i just recorded mm. with it's going up next week the ad man in, in uh, uh new york who said within a two days at pratt back in 1960 or no, in the 19, early 1950s, he realized, not really where I need to be. You know, I, yeah. I, I need to go become, you know, uh, I need to go work in an ad agency, not, you know, yeah. 
<laughs> sitting here studying. Um, remember your first professional publication? Uh, yes, it was the New Statesman, mm -hmm. 1982. Uh, six months after I graduated, I pitched uh, an idea for a series, um, which was uh, I'm still very fond of. It was a, a series of utterly imbecilic puns based about the defining texts of uh, Marxism. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> Which brings you back to your current work. Yeah, now. it brings that's, back to my current good. work. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the first one they published, it was um, Marx and Engels explore an old house and there's Engels standing on a toilet looking into the system and say, hey, Marx, there's a couple of those antique Stradivarius fiddles in here. Aha, Engels, clearly the violins inherited in the system. <laughs> And it went on from there. And I hate you. <laughs> and they, and they. Uh, in fact, I, I claim the uh, the very popular joke of it was Proudhon and Bakunin having tea in Tunbridge Wells, and Bakunin spitting out his tea, saying, "Jesus Christ, this is disgusting. This isn't property. So, oh no, but property is theft." And on it goes. <laughs> and um, that ran for a year. A book came out of it. Uh, by which time, I was a professional cartoonist. Because I had to sign off because I went on holiday. You know? yeah. I was signing on at the same time, getting state benefits. But mm. um, how did your family take the uh, the occupation? My father was always saying, "Oh, you ought to become an accountant." I've been a terrible accountant because he was worried about my income. Yeah, um, yeah. that's but, what I wonder. Most yeah. parents have yeah. the you know. Arm. And then I I told him because I was you know after, I mean I was working in the national press after three years. So when I was in my mid twenties, and. Um, I said, I told him how much money I was earning. And he said, you should get an accountant. I said, I've already got one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but they were su well, supportive at all? Yeah, was they, were, just they, a, were, they, they were they were very proud. We don't understand our son. Let's just let him, you know. No, no, no. They, um, they, they, they were supportive. No, no, my, my father was one of the great – I was adopted. He was my adopted father. Mm. But he was a, one of the greatest influences on me because he was a, he was a scientist, but he was extremely skeptical about things. Mm -hmm. And um, he was really a kind of anarchist in a way. And I think he gave me a sensibility which has fueled my career in many ways. What field of science do you remember? He was a virologist. Ah. In addition to the editorial cartooning, mm -hmm. the literary adaptations, the you read English in Cambridge, mm -hmm. I think. I don't know how to put it outside of how do you balance those, or where did the the, the literary upbringing <clears throat> come from, and how do you manage this, in, or you know, integrate it into the the art and how you work. Uh it's like sort of asking about yeah. Hitchens writing, um, you know, the, the political writing and then doing, you know, literary reviews that were yeah. essentially apolitical. But, um, you know. Well, I got a very bad degree in Cambridge because I, I hated the course and I was too busy drawing stupid drawings of two-bit student papers. Uh, but I got into reading English literature because I love English literature. And there are large parts of it I hate as well. And I'll ask you about those after. Yeah, but, well, it yeah. was... It was um, this sort of weird graphic novel side project started off when, um, you know, I'd, I'd had two books published. I'd had Scenes from the Lives of the Great Socialists published in 1983, and then I'd done a, uh, a pseudonymous book attacking, which I wrote under a pseudonym of Kevin Killane, who was a Marxist polymath I'd made up. Mm -hmm. uh, I've met people who'd read his books, which is rather nice, because they don't exist in the <laughs> uh, Shows but, up in other people's yeah, bibliographies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and... Um, and I was thinking about the third book, and I'd sort of I'd, I'd done politics, I'd done sort of stupid puns, and I was just uh, having lunch with my then agent, and he said, "Come on, you, you know what, what? What do you really hate? What do you really hate?" And I said, "You know what? I really fucking I fucking hate the Wasteland by T.S.M. I really, <laughs> really hate that poem because it's you know put back English poetry by seventy years, a load of a sort of obscurantist and obscure elitist garbage, and you know reads like some of the gaudier lyrics of the early Led Zeppelin, to be honest." <laughs> And um, he said, OK, well, go away and do that. And I thought about it. And I thought, well, I could do it as a colouring book. Colour this rock red, colour Mr Elliot's mood black. <laughs> and then I had a sudden flash of inspiration, as one does, um, from somewhere or other, where I collided the, si the, the, the section of the poem called Death by Water, as Phlebas the Phoenician, a fortnight dead, with that scene in Howard Hawks' The Big Sleep, where they are dredging the... Um, the chauffeur in his Packard out of the bay. And I just sort of had these two urges come together, yeah. bing! And I yeah. thought, oh, hey, wow, let's tell the Wasteland as a charm the rest film noir, uh, uh, which I then did, which was my first graphic novel, which um, sort of 
slightly died the death because Penguin didn't know what to do with it. They didn't. They, they, um, I think it's still in that era when nobody quite yeah, knew the marketing and, for and bookstores. And they, they sort of put it under all sorts of different things, so people didn't know where to put it in the bookshop. <laughs> and they pulped it after about eighteen months. But which point it had become a set text in American universities. So, yeah. <laughs> so it, it didn't fulfil its original purpose, which was to take the piss out of GSA because it was used to teach the kids yeah. the wasteland. And um, and I'm still very proud of that book. Uh, and I vowed I'd never do another graphic novel because it almost killed me, almost drove me mad doing it. Uh, it took me 18 months, halfway through which our first child was born, so there were all sorts of things going on. Yeah. Um, and then I was invited over to Dublin by the publisher of my late mother-in-law, who was an Irish historian, uh, who took me out to the pub and said, um, why don't you do Tristram Shandy? And I said, that is one of the most deranged yeah. ideas I've ever heard of. <laughs> Actually, it's quite a good deranged idea. And then I let things percolate through my mind. And and lo and behold, there was Tristram Shandy, which took me three and a half years. Yeah, I was going to say that. That seems like a much more encompassing yeah. project. And than the that was life. a joy. I mean, yeah. having the Reverend Stern's ghost mm-hmm. wafting around my drawing board was actually rather wonderful. And, and, and I love that book. It's my, my favorite of my books. And then um, Gulliver's Travels. I mean, there, there is no kind of program. There's no policy. There's no sort of career path here they're all kind of randomly occurring uh, Gulliver's Travels was different because I first thought of it 20 years ago after the death of Princess Diana when we had a kind of collective national nervous breakdown over here and people said nobody would ever laugh again and satire was dead people were always saying satire yeah. was dead. we got that in 2001 yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, no, I think there. irony is dead that was yeah, uh, yeah. Graydon Carter's thing which yeah. 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 Well, anyway, anyway, yeah. sort of you know, yeah. Tom there is saying that satire was dead when Kissinger got the Nobel Peace Prize and so on. Yeah. And I thought, no, so that satire... made more sense for Arafat because he kept yeah. the Nobel family in business with yeah. all that dynamite. But, <laughs> but anyway, thank I you, mean, thank it, you very much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the um, the point about um, satire is it's never dead. Mm-hmm. It, it can't be dead because we need it. We need, it's a survival tool. We need it. We need to laugh at these bastards, and we need to cheer ourselves up about the terrible things surrounding us all the time, you know, the shit, the power, the death, and all that kind of stuff, which is why all jokes are basically knocking copy. They're all laughing about somebody else's misfortune, even if it's your own misfortune, which mm-hmm. is a very rich scene of humour. And again, almost in its entirety, I thought, well, you know, I've got to do one for satire. I've got to sort of, you know, big up satire. And I got the, the idea completely in my head of updating Gulliver's Travels. Mm-hmm. But I then realised I had to wait for new labour, to work itself through, (laughs) which, as it happens, took 12 years. Mm -hmm. So I then had to put it on the shelf for 12 years until new new, new labour, yeah, until until it had all sort of worked its way through the system. Um, And it was ticking away in the back of my head. Um, I tried to pitch some other ideas to a publisher. I just rather rather like the idea of doing um, Notre Dame de Paris, or the Hunchback of Notre Dame, which is vulgarly known, um, as a silent book with no text, just sort of images. Um, but, you can hold a second if you want to put it down. And I, I pitched that idea, and the uh, publisher said, no, 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 we don't like that. No, 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 we don't want that. Mm-hmm. Um, anything else? I said, well, there's a Gulliver's Travels. Yes, do it now. <laughs> <laughs> I must admit, I mean, that I think it took me about 13 months, 13, 14 months, not as long as the other two. But when I finished it, I felt so depressed. Yeah. I really did seriously consider just sort of painting kittens in teacups. Mm-hmm. Uh, because Swift is, a, is, is not a pleasant character to be knocking around with. Mm-hmm. When you've got Stern, Stern's a laugh. Swift is a very stern. Yeah. And, of course, in my version of Gulliver's Travels, everything's got much, much worse. As we have. Yeah, as we have. So at least now you moved over to... Uh... Yeah, and, and now I'm doing the Communist Manifesto, which I'm doing, um, which an idea which didn't originate with me, but the wonderful Emma Haley at Self Made Hero ran me up and said, it's Marx's 200th birthday next year. Do you want to do the Communist Manifesto? And I suddenly thought, yeah, okay, I've got the beginning, I've got the end, and I just have to fill it in. That's how every time I do a book, it, I get really the beginning and like I get it. the end and I fill in the... Huh. Interesting. Had you looked at doing um, extended narrative non-adaptation i've got a a comic book coming out from knockabout which is a a collection of seven silent comics which Mm -hmm. i've done over the years for various people yeah 
So, I mean, one of them is about 21 pages long, and, and that, is a, that is a narrative. Yeah. That's um, what I wonder if you're interested in that, you know, going in that direction too without yeah. being pretentious and saying graphic novel, which is one of my most hated terms ever. Well, it's, it's like, you know, hey, I'm a graphic novelist. I prefer a long comic book. But, yeah, long comic book. Well, I, yeah. I, I, I prefer a comic <laughs> book because um, this, is, this is something I, I – I, there are lots of people in many different realms of life who hate my guts – and some of them are comics fans, <laughs> because I have not been... It's better to be wanted for murder than not to be wanted at all. Yeah, That's, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and w one reason is I, I have in the past not been that bashful about saying what I think about certain aspects of the industry. So yeah. it's immense pretension, how incredibly dull some of these things are. Yeah. Um, the terrible trap of respectability and academic respectability mm -hmm. that um, some comics artists have allowed themselves to fall into. I mean, I had to review a book which, for the London Review of Books last year, which they didn't actually run because, it's, well, you know, it's a great review, but actually the book isn't important enough. But it was, it was a truly <laughs> appalling book by an American academic uh, who's, I, I won't tell you her name because I can't remember, but you can probably find out quite easily from what I'm suggesting. But it used the word comics as a singular uh, Every time I read this, yeah. I'd scream and I couldn't read again for about three days. You know, comics is, and I just this, and I finished uh, off. I finished yeah. off the review saying, you know, one day she'll wander off campus and she'll go to the local comic shop and there'll be some sort of smelly teenagers thumbing through swamp thing, and she'll go up to the sort of the stone long hair behind the counter and said, "Have you any comicses in this week?" <laughs> <laughs> So you're seeing new comics with an X on the end, like Art Spiegelman does, yeah. but you know, it gives you yeah. some sort of yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I'm with you. That, that, I just wondered, you know, given the the history of your work or the mm. you know the, the body of your work so far, whether that was something you'd looked at or you know whether long form narrative, either fictional or any sort of you know memoir. Yeah. Well, I've, in that I, well I've, I've I've done I've, I've done a, you know, a memoir. Thing. I've yeah. done a memoir which was long listed for the Samuel Johnson Prize. But thank you very much. It wasn't shortlisted. Bastards. Um, and they were calling me before this and talking shit about you, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, that was, again, a, a, it was a, a book about my parents dying and hmm. clearing out their house with other stuff involved, and it was called Stuff. And, um, again, I had the beginning and I had the end, and I just filled it in. I wrote that in about three months, mm -hmm. and I think it's about 140,000 words. Um, so I've done, I've done sort of long-form writing and long-form drawing. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's interesting, but, you know, it's... Um, people have suggested to me doing literary adaptations straight in the kind of classics illustrated way, which I've always thought is a complete waste of time. Yeah. I mean, it's boring. In each of the ones I've done, I've sort of done something completely different yeah. and, and you really clashed adapted it in different them. ways. And, uh, you know, otherwise, well, I, after the lovely self-made hero reissued Tristram Shandy, which had then fallen out of print, and I went there with my agent to sort of pitch some ideas to them. One of which uh, was a version of Oscar Wilde's portrait of Dorian Gray, picture of Dorian Gray, rather. And I wanted to do it in the style of William Blake. Yeah. I'm smiling behind this. Go on. Yeah. No, sorry. I tell a lie. No, no, no. Not, no. I wanted to do it in the style of Aubrey Beardsley. Ooh. And I wanted to do Frankenstein in the style of William Blake. Mm-hmm. These are the two ideas I pitched to them. Yeah. And they said, oh, there's thousands of versions of Frankenstein. I said, yeah, but they're all shit. Anyway, and I said, well, there's dozens of Dorian Greys. Well, in fact, there are three Dorian Greys. And I actually went to Forbidden Planet afterwards and looked at them. They're just trash. They're boring. Yeah. There's nothing new or interesting in it. And then I said, well, the last thing the world needs is a graphic novel version of Pride and Prejudice. Oh, we're publishing that next month. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and... Um, and, you know, obviously there is a market for these things. People enjoy this kind of thing. But, you know, to, to have such a potentially rich medium limited in most of its output to sort of three kinds of things. So you have uh, the Marvel DC stuff, which people love, you know, if they like that kind of thing. Whatever floats their boat doesn't float mine particularly. Some very fine artists, like my friend John McRae. Oh, but, sure. You know. Um, but you know, it doesn't necessarily, it's not the kind of thing I'm going to be doing. Um, and then there's these incredibly dull, endless squares of people just standing there talking. The graphic novel. The graphic Please. novel. Yes. <laughs> uh, and, and you just think, why? And some of them I can't even read because I don't know which way the 
my eyes meant to go. I don't know how I'm yeah. meant to navigate my way across the page. Um, maybe that's just me being old and stupid. But um, but I, you know, I'm a satirist mostly, and I always see my role in almost everything I do is to lower the tone. And when I'm surrounded by people saying, well, this is actually marvellous stuff, we've got academics writing about it, you know, they're not comic books, they're graphic novels, you know, novels, novelists are good, you know, you ever see one eat, you ever met a novelist? You know, they're not, they're terrible people, <laughs> you know. Um, but trying to sort of muscle their way into a, uh, a part of the ecology, which is not where this stuff belongs. Right. This stuff belongs being subversive in teenagers' rooms, lowering the tone. That's what's so good about it. Yeah. But to sort of try and heighten the tone and say, well, this is, we'll have a Kingsley Amos doing a bloody graphic novel. Yeah. If I well, did a cartoon strip about Kingsley Amos doing a graphic novel, it's called Bitch Sluts from Hell Planet Hampstead. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing, getting that academic your seal of approval, getting yeah. that, that sense that, you know, we're part of the, the academy now, yeah. we're, we're treated with credibility. Mm. You know, when I was a kid at the the 70s and 80s, you know, yeah, you would aspire to that sort of, you know, comics are are legit. But then you realize what legitimacy brings with it. Yeah. And that's the, you know, that level of pretense, I guess, that makes it all unfun. Uh, but, yeah. Also, I mean, most of my adult life has been dominated by the idea that the novel is the the highest attainment of all human culture. And in fact, it isn't. Mm -hmm. the, Stern was right about the novel. Yeah. 250 years ago. Actually, it's an incredibly fragile vessel into which to pour reality. And for the most part, most novels shouldn't have been written. <laughs> and I've, I've done a good job of not writing any of my yeah, time, yeah. so I feel yeah. good. I mean, but, I yeah. used to think, yeah. oh, I must write a novel one day. And I thought, no, 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 no. Don't do that. Martin. Who needs Don't that? Don't burden the world with that. Um, and, you know, well, there's, there's a wonderful uh, footnote in the great art critic John Ruskin's um Stones of Venice, I think it's in chapter 11. And it's on the chapter of the pathetic fallacy, where he lays into German metaphysics. And there's just this wonderful footnote that says, I admit to two orders of poetry, but no third. And there's two orders of, there's Shakespearean poetry and there's sort of the poetry of Dante. And he says, as to the third, all so-called would-be poets more heroically burn everything they've written. There is more than enough for all of us to read to fill a lifetime. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which is true. There is more than enough for all of us to read to fill a lifetime. So why burden us with more of it? I'm down. All I do is give people conversation every, uh, every <laughs> week. But, you know, I, I don't answer around transcribing or, or yeah, you know, yeah. writing. Um, where did the, the literary impulse begin for you? Uh, How big a reader were you when you were young, I guess? Oh, no, I, was reading, reading. I, was reading, I was reading and drawing from a very early age. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, 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 was, I think I read most of Evelyn Waugh by the time I was 12. Okay. I just got around a sort of honor over the, the yeah. holidays. That was something, but go on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and <laughs> it's just one of those things. It's, you know, it's, it, it is the realms of wonder inside your head, mm -hmm. which uh, whenever I give a talk, I usually start off by holding up a pen. It happens to be a pen given to me by Ronald Searle. Uh, and say, so, you know, do you see what this is? This is a this is a key to a universes. This thing kills kings, but it also unlocks fathomless depths of joy and amazement because it does it. All of which is inside our heads, hmm. and it's the way the medium through which we get the stuff inside our heads out there, so we can share it with other people. The more you teach younger, well, students, we'll just say. Do you think about what you would do if you were starting out now, if you were their age? <laughs> um, that's a good question. What would I do if I started out now? Um, it just seems that the I career think, paths and the economics aren't yeah. available for the younger yeah, guys. Yeah, well, my, but my, my, my advice to um, to aspiring cartoonists, a lot of them ask me what to do. They say, you know, well, draw. 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 Avoid, avoid doing a day job. If you possibly can, if you've um, if you've got enough money, or indulgent parents, just carry on drawing um, and develop a thick skin. You need to combine sloth and arrogance. You need to be too lazy to get a proper job in insurance, yeah. and you need to be arrogant to believe you're good enough to succeed. And you know, in the first few years after the statesman gig, oh, pretty rough, pretty frightening. Yeah. Um, and I was signing on. I mean, you know, I was get on the door. And then I was doing a lot of stuff for trade papers, which friends of mine from university were working on. That's the other advice I give them. They say print is dead. Go into any news agents. There are thousands of bloody magazines, specialist magazines there, who are 
crying out for illustration because an awful lot of them are incredibly boring. Oh, I, I spent 17 years as the editor of a trade magazine, yeah. business to business magazine, yeah. um, before taking on my current gig. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I know this. And, uh, yeah. you know, I started off really doing financial cartooning, mm -hmm. and I still don't know the difference between a bull and a bear market. But what it taught me was how to handle a brief and the value of deadlines. And, and deadlines are actually the most joyous thing. This is why I call myself a journalist. Because an artist can carry on retouching the canvas forever. Um, I've got a file within four hours. I've got to get it. Yeah. The, under, the illustrators the I know tend to be much more driven like that. Blit, yeah. Cuneo, Chardello, yeah. people like yeah. that. It's it's got to go. I got to go fax it in, or yeah. I got to you know email it. And over. it's that, it's that adrenaline thrill mm -hmm. of the sort of pure terror which stops you thinking, God, this is boring. Um, you know, quite often I'll find myself. You know, I start. I, I always try to file by six o'clock. It's a little personal deadline. Where my friend and colleague Steve Bell says to file at eight to the fury of the sub editors on the opinion desk at the <laughs> Just so they don't have time to say no? Yeah, yeah. yeah well, exactly. Yeah. Exactly so. <laughs> um, and um, quite often, about 20 past five, I'll find myself just starting to draw a herd of 3,000 pigs wearing pinstripe suits on the horizon. Well, <laughs> oh, I'm a professional, I can do this. And, you know, usually I can. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that fear of deadline or exhilaration of deadline is yeah. that, that's the, the yeah. key. Yeah, how's the job? changed i guess i mean we've talked about how the political situation has changed and made the world much more desperate but you know how has what you do gotten different over the the 30 years or so um 35? color yeah is the main difference the when i started out you know i was doing the same as Taniel and leech engraving and, and yeah and, it was yeah. it was black and white line and then they started introducing color which was a nightmare because they reproduced it so badly and when I first started doing colour, um, which was in the late 80s, I was doing it in an incredibly laborious way because I was doing it in sort of line with ink. Mm -hmm. And then when... I used to paint a lot when I was a teenager. In fact, I was quite a good painter when I was a teenager. Uh, and so in the sort of late 90s, I had to teach myself to paint again and f played around with various different, um, different media and then realised what you can achieve with Bristol paper and gouache is extraordinary. And people say, my God, how long did that take you? And I said, well, actually, that bit of sky up there looks so complicated. That took me about three minutes. Yeah. Because it's called impressionism. You know? <laughs> and um, and it's, it was actually rather wonderful. And I, when I hit 50, I was conscious of a, a change in my attitude to the whole business, which was actually the message was becoming less important than the medium that I was getting more pleasure out of the painting than I was in sticking it to them. Hmm. And that was the first time it happened. Before that, it was just... And I, I interviewed Ralph Steadman uh, over the summer for a radio show. He turned me down. Yeah, He's he? doing too much publicity yeah. uh, for he the US. Well. He hasn't been well. Yeah, that so. was part of it, yeah, too. Yeah, I was like, yeah. I, I, I can come to your door yeah. and just... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, After this, I'm sure he'll say, yeah, that yeah. son of a bitch, I better go yeah. to... Yeah. Um, and I, uh, I asked him, you know, what, what, what motivated him in the first place? Was it the beauty, the lure of the beauty of art? Or was it to change the world? And he said, oh, I'm doing to change the world. And look, I did. Look what happened to it. <laughs> <laughs> Which was a very Ralph thing to say. But, yeah. Um, and, yeah, it, it, I'm still mostly in thinking about things motivated by fury and rage at these bastards, you know, as, as we live in this terrible era where everybody feels it is their greatest human rights to be permanently offended. I would stick my hand up and say, well, actually, that's my job. Yeah. That's my job. I'm <laughs> it's the a profession. Person. It's a profession. You should get, you know, you need to do, you need to do the exams if you're just going to be offended, you know, and I, and I can channel that for your amusement, but just being offended all the time by everything, give it a break. Um, but once you're at the table itself. But once, once I'm at the table, I go into a kind of calm, zen-like state. Hmm. It's interesting, a, a few years ago, um, the book stuff I mentioned earlier on, I was invited on the strength of that to uh, an event in Berlin, which was run by the British Council, which had been going for decades, where you get a bunch of British writers who would meet a bunch of German uh, academics teaching English literature. And this was about life writing. My friend Blake Morrison had written a book about his late father who was organising the whole thing. And um, one of the other speakers was a writer called Tim Parks, who had had a hideous medical complaint problem where he needed to have a pee every 20 minutes. And 
Did he have prostate cancer? No, he didn't. Did he have bladder cancer? No, he didn't. Nobody could work out what it was until they worked out his perineum was sort of knotted because he was permanently anxious about things. <laughs> it's permanently anxious. He's constantly sort of echolocating into the future about what's going to happen, what's going to go wrong next. Mm. And he finally took a course of non-denominational transcendental meditation to calm him down. He wrote a book called How to Sit Still. And it was, he gave a very interesting talk. Nice man. I liked him a lot. On the Friday night at this event, I was the cabaret, so I gave my all singing, all swearing, um, sort of like with dogs snoring next to my microphone, uh, all singing, all dancing, all swearing, a guide to the history of visual satire. And Tim came up to me in the bar afterwards, and he sort of hunched up, and he said, Martin, Martin, that was brilliant, but, you know, I'm really worried about your health, because you're so angry. <laughs> and I said, look, Tim, look at me and look at you. You know, you're sort of knotted up, you're sort of hugging yourself. And, you know, I'm, I am angry. I get angry about the things everybody should get angry about. But then I spend four hours doing watercolours. And, and that's the beauty of it, mm -hmm. actually. I calm down doing watercolours, listening to beautiful music, thinking beautiful thoughts, staring out of the window at the beautiful <laughs> park opposite my... It is pretty lovely. Yeah. That, that's, you know... It always impresses me when cartoonists can actually make a living and have a decent home. But, yeah. <laughs> unless this is a squat or something. I'm just no, 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 no. <laughs> Uh, you did talk about um, selling artwork of your own and, mm. and you know, uh, publishing and then and selling. Um, you mentioned in an earlier interview selling to UKIP. Oh, yeah. 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 Is this sort of thing you regret at all in terms no. of, okay, uh, just, just. No, it's like, know, it's like, it's like, like um, I mean, it's like uh, people say, how could you work for Rupert Murdoch? Which I did. I worked for The Times for about three and a half years. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, it's, it's, it's theft in a way. Yeah. And it means he can't spend it on anything more dangerous. You know, the money I took from UKIP, they now they, they couldn't spend on anything else. Yeah, yeah. And I figure um, Matt Groening has this with the the whole uh, having the Simpsons on Fox. Anytime they yeah. they'd gotten issues about it, He's, I've got thirty years of of subverting of, you know American yeah, stealing, culture, stealing money from Rupert Murdoch. Yeah. I mean, what's wrong with that? Yeah, he did have the. Um, uh, I think it was a a uh, one of those opening sequences. Uh, somebody character was watching Fox News and it just had an ad for it underneath uh, where it said not racist but number one among racists and <laughs> <laughs> that was a one time Fox apparently had a, you know yeah. Matt maybe you can tone that down yeah. a little bit you are cashing checks from us so yeah. well years ago uh, when I was doing a financial I was doing pocket cartoons for the finance pages of a long dead newspaper called Today which at that stage was owned by Rupert Murdoch and I'd done a cartoon about um, the flotation of shares in Euro Disney I did the obvious cartoon. It's my other piece of advice to cartoon. Always go for the obvious joke. And it was just these Disney characters as stockbrokers, you know, wearing striped shirts and braces, shouting, bye, bye, sell, sell. And, of course, they got the customary lawyer's response from the Disney Corporation. There's yeah. a gross infringement of copyrighted material, exemplary damages through all known courts in the world. And the paper's mm -hmm. lawyer rang up and said, look, we're owned by Rupert Murdoch. We're bigger than you are. Fuck off and put the phone down. Yeah. And I've been grateful to Rupert ever since for that. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you talk about doing a, when you talk about teaching uh, like history of satire, cool. and and you, know, you mentioned thousand, multi thousand year history of this, at what point did you become cognizant of the tradition that you were in? Oh, that's where that's where I started from. Okay, that, that is literally where I started. Because it, it sounded was, like yeah, the Gilray yeah, yeah. vibe. When um, you were, you I mean, were I was I draw, I'm digits. drawing from um, for as long as I can remember. Yeah, um, looking at newspaper cartoons for as long as I can remember. And then when I was ten, I picked up my sister's school history textbook, which was the Illustrated History of Modern Britain, 1780 to 1950. Yeah, just the quiet years. Just yeah, the so. quiet years, <laughs> and it was of course illustrated throughout with Gilray's, Crookshanks, Tenniel's. Um, Bernard Partridge, very boring. But then David Lowe, who was fantastic. And it was it was an epiphanic moment. I mean, I remember going to my father's desk and finding some old steel nibs to see if I could crosshatch like Gilray etched. And I just steeped myself in this history of visual satire because I just thought, you know, I was interested. I was obsessed with politics. I could draw. And this was the perfect marriage of my two obsessions yeah and getting it into the sense of it being a context i guess yeah. the fact that you're discovering it in a history book yeah. means you're you're already yeah placing it all where it yeah. is it's interesting because I, I i just sort of assumed there would be a you know a starting point and then figuring out that you're part of a, a longer tradition no, that, was the, that, that was the starting point yeah. that was the starting point and um but also it being for so long an accepted part of 
the political life of this country that you're there to take the piss out of them. Yeah. And that's the one thing that, that Britain has that the U.S., we just don't yeah. have that same sense of savagery, uh, the, the same sense of, you know, you have to just bust people's balls. About, yeah, well, it's, yeah. it's interesting. When The Guardian first started putting my stuff and Steve Bell's stuff on the, uh, their website, when their website really took off in America after 9-11, when your liberal press collapsed uh, in the face of the homeland security and the Bush administration. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but getting a seriously visceral response from people um, to our work, which is very much in the Gilray tradition. And, you know, get a lot of people, you miserable limey asshole, how dare you draw our president as a monkey? I don't, Steve Bell does, because he got in there first. Yeah, lousy son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, he's our commander in chief. You wouldn't draw your royal family like this. Excuse me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Could you just look at 300 years worth of drawings, you know? And, um, and there's a wonderful story told by Kenneth Baker, the former. Tory cabinet minister, who's also a, a serious cartoon collector, knows his stuff, I like Kenneth a lot, um, about how the French ambassador at the court of St. James in about 1785 wrote a dispatch to Versailles saying this country is on the verge of a revolution. It'll be like it was 140 years ago. They'll chop off the king's head, there'll be blood in the streets, it'll be a total nightmare. My evidence for this, walk down any main thoroughfare in London. There are all these booths and kiosks selling the most disgraceful satirical depictions of the royal family. And, of course, he was completely wrong. He was absolutely upside-down wrong yeah. because that's how we avoided revolution, yeah. whereas in France they had no history of this. They had sort of Samizdat sex libels about Marianne Antoinette, but otherwise it was a pressure cooker which exploded yeah. and spattered everybody in blood. And there's part of me thinking, well, you know, if you're going to get to a pre-revolutionary sensibility, you actually need a bit more sort of suppression. And actually, then again, blood yeah. in the streets, I don't really want that. Philip Roth and George Packer had that. that yeah. went back during the Cold War, I think it was Packer saying that the, the only true art is coming from these writers behind the Iron Curtain because they're oppressed. And mm -hmm. Roth was like, yeah, that sounds good. The problem is they all want to come here and be free. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I know you think it's romantic that they're... they're well, it's, uh, yeah. that, but, I mean, there yeah. was some... Um, riffing on that on that theme uh in 1989 uh steve and i had uh, steve bell and i had lunch at the suggestion of a friend of my wife's who's working in the foreign office uh with a romanian cartoonist whose name i can't remember now but uh, it was very very odd lunch because he was there with this british council minder who was a very formidable woman who sent her bloody mary back because there wasn't enough vodka in it and he didn't speak any english he spoke a tiny bit of french um, and it was all sort of rather difficult and a bit strained. And I thought, well, we've got to liven this up somehow. So I proposed a toast to the death of Ceausescu. You know, eight weeks later, there he was in the snow, <laughs> surrounded by his <laughs> own blood. Chased you know, through yeah, his yeah, courtyard so, you know, by his and I thought, if we've got the same people in the same place, we'd kill anybody. But um, he showed us all his cartoons, which were very much of that East European dissident school. So you'd have a building with no roof it's just solid brick walls and there's a human pyramid inside and the person looking out over the top is blind <laughs> and you which is yeah. very much a sort of dove of peace in a cage kind of school of international yoyism and i just thought what happened to him after the revolution he'd be going around to all the magazines in bucharest and they said no we want funny now we've done yeah. that <laughs> move yeah. on yeah. give us some desert island anymore. jokes you know yeah that's what you wonder if anybody's got a sense of humor after making it through. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, man. Um, you mentioned, well, you mentioned being friends with politicians mm. and, and people like Baker. Um, how difficult is that in terms of people you know that you're going to end up caricaturing and, and you know. Oh, no difficulty at all. Drawing savages. No, no, no. Okay, they, 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 okay. they, they know it's part of the game. Yeah. And, it, and to a large extent, it is a game. I mean, people think, well, you know, you're trying to do what I admit to doing, which is assassination without the blood. Yeah. I'm there to keep them in their place. But without doing, uh, without descending into court jester yeah, mode, I guess. Yeah. How do you balance that? That's, uh, that's... Yeah, well, you're just in, in, incredibly rude. Good. And, okay. <laughs> and, and they either take it or they don't take it. And I've often characterized it as mind over matter. They pretend they don't mind while we pretend we matter <laughs> <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, but uh, no, I mean, I, I'm, I'm on good terms with quite a few politicians. Um, I'm on very good terms with several uh, Ken Livingstone, for example, former mayor of London, um, who I've drawn in a most horrific way, and he just sort of rolls yeah. with it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a sort of unstated thing. You asked earlier on about libel actions. The, the unstated rule 
is that they're not allowed to complain about it. They might hate it, and a lot of them do. I mean, there's a wonderful story about the Cabinet Secretary saying to Stanley Baldwin, look at this Lowe cartoon, isn't it brilliant? Don't you love Lowe? And Stanley Baldwin saying, no, I don't. Lowe is evil and vile. I hate Lowe. Yeah. I hate him. And Lowe did pretty you know, friendly pictures of Baldwin as a kind of old farmer, but Baldwin hated it. Um, and it's... Uh, so it's... They, they, the one unforgivable crime in British public life is admitting you have no sense of humour. I mean, it is genuinely unforgivable. Mm-hmm. And so they pretend it's just all jolly good fun. I mean, I've interviewed uh, Anne Widdicombe, who's a right-wing Catholic uh, Tory former MP, and I disagree with her on, I think, almost everything. We might form a loose consensus on breathing. <laughs> That's about it. But I like her. She does what she does. I do what I do. And I interviewed her once while drawing her. And she said, oh, they're just jolly good fun, aren't they, cartoons? They're such jolly good fun. And I said, well, no, no, this is assassination without the blood, man. We really are trying to destroy you. Said, oh, no, no, it's just jolly good fun. Of course, she has to think that. Yeah. Otherwise, she'd go mad, realising that there people could do there. such terrible things. Yeah. You know? <laughs> You did mention uh, sections of English literature that you hate, in addition to the ones that you love. Yeah. Who do you hate? Um, that doesn't have to be contemporary, obviously. No, well, I, wait, I assume the, we were going back into yeah, the way 17, started. 18. I mean, yeah. Samuel Richardson could never get on with that at all. Um, I'm just trying to think that there was... That there's, um, my agent said to me a few years ago, you're the only one of my clients who doesn't read modern fiction. So modern fiction, I hate. <laughs> yeah, that, that's pretty much a given in, in yeah. my book. <laughs> um, although, I mean, there, there are exceptions. Um, well, you're friends with Will Self, I'm so friends you with can't Will talk Self. shit No, 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 I can't so. talk shit because Will is actually very, very good. Um, I, I feel do. bad I haven't read him, but I do have the book he did with Stedman, so I have to, yeah. to you know. Yeah, psychogeographies, yeah. yeah. Um, the, uh, I mean, that bit, I just, there's just things where you sort of, your heart dies, just even thinking about it. I mean, even thinking about Martin Amos, just, you know, yeah. you think, why? Why? Mm. What is the point? And uh, I used to have a cartoon strip on the book's pages of The Independent on Sunday, which was about a dog called Pete who was trying to write a novel. Uh, for three and a half years, he failed to write his novel, but he had many adventures on the way mm. in various different ways. And I killed off Martin Amos eight times. <laughs> A series of increasingly bizarre accidents. Martin Amos get killed again. A bit like Kenny in um, South Park. South Park. <laughs> yeah, is he uh, uh, acquaintance of yours at all or, or somebody who's ever had a... I met him, what the hell does he hate me for? No, I, certainly... I met him once um, where he must have been in his 50s by that stage. And he said in a very gleeful way, I'm smoking a reinforced cigarette. <laughs> so he was smoking a joint. I thought, for fuck's sake, Martin Amos, don't have to tell us. <laughs> You could put two and two together at yeah, that point. I mean, and, yeah, I mean, you know, nobody cares. So, yeah. You know, you're not shocking anybody here. Yeah. But now what? he's a hipster living in Brooklyn, so that's, uh, yeah. you know, it's, he's our problem and not yours. Yeah, I that's guess. true. That's true. <laughs> um, last question. Tips for how you portray Trump visually. Oh, um, that, that comes from Matt Worker, who said, okay. just ask him, you know, how does he do that? You know? Yeah, well, Trump, um, when Trump got elected, I actually ordered in extra tubes of orange gouache <laughs> um the, the thing about trump is is you realize that he is just he's basically a sphere a sphere with a mouth um and there are things about him I mean, it's the same with anybody you draw that you notice more the more you look at them so when i first started out i hadn't quite got the fact that his eyes are a different color from the rest of his face Oh, he right every, around the eyes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tom Tomorrow does that beautifully, yeah. and it's all that flat clip art looking style. Yeah. But he yeah. lightens the space around the yeah. eyes, which yeah. everybody now does because we've all yeah. noticed it. And then I think I was the first British cartoonist to notice how long his tie was, and we all now do him with yeah. an incredibly long tie. And it's just little things like that. But but just to make him more and more blob like because he is—he's just <laughs> an orange blob. I mean, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, welcome to America. <laughs> yeah, welcome to America. Yeah, do you guys well, go I'm, through the the morning like? psychosis the way we do like you just wake up wondering what did anything happen overnight <laughs> no you, no no we, 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 we had all that we had all that last year with brexit you know we yeah. just wake up every morning some more new fresh hell had erupted and you just yeah. oh god whereas now we're just kind of into sort of deranged denial it's like sort of watching somebody die of cancer of the arsehole yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're just waiting for it to happen you know <laughs> how much longer you know past the kool-aid um 
I shouldn't have said that. I'll get letters from people who cancel the arsehole. Never That's mind. only if they ever listen to my show. And yeah, trust me, no, nobody's listening. We're, we're okay. <laughs> but I am, I am going to uh, the American Association of Editorial Cartoonists convention next yeah. week, which I'm looking forward to immensely. Um, yeah, and and Telnus's question was, um, just make sure he's not late. For his presentation, so it wasn't really a question, but that was okay. all she had. Was you know, I just want to make sure he's there and on time. Well, I've been yeah. I've been corresponding with Anne a lot, who I've yeah. not yet met, but uh, I can tell. Organizing cartoonists, yeah, it's not not anything. hurting cats. Yeah, hurting, except, hurting you know, cats is is easy compared to a sloth and arrogance. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. <laughs> um, but anyway, to, to, to my slight surprise, they're letting me in. They're letting me into the country. I did wonder about, do you have any, like, I don't think they've actually implemented the, you know, like, you have to declare your social media yeah. identities and, and turn over stuff, but is that a... Well, there, there was an option okay. on the form, yeah. which I chose not to take up. <laughs> I hope I, I hear that you made it into the country next week, yeah. so we'll, we'll, we'll find out. Well, so. you know, as I believe that air travel is one of the most unpleasant things that people voluntarily agree to do... Um, it is basically like the middle passage, only voluntary. That you're yeah. just packed in, and and they just make it so unpleasant on the way there. Mm -hmm. And a few years ago, I um, was invited. It was about ten years ago. Invited to the first ever political awards in Northern Ireland. So the peace process got to the point where they could actually get these people in the same room without them literally wanting to kill each other. Yeah. And I was there to draw the winners, and that was their prize. So they go up and. Then they'd sit down at a table. I'd draw them, and that'd be put in a frame, and that would be their prize, which is a nice gig. Um, and on my way there through Stansted Airport, I had a bottle of ink with me. And, of course, it was too big. It was too large. Yes. Because you could be, take out a plane with that ink. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so they confiscated it, which was really quite annoying, because we then had to scour through Belfast for an art supply shop to find some bloody ink. And I was on the point of saying... Can you put down the fact that my ink is a terrorist weapon in writing, please? It will help my career. And then I suddenly had an image of myself naked in a room for 15 hours, spread eagled. And I shut up, Martin, shut up. Not everything's a joke. <laughs> See, it's a lot easier. I, I, uh, going through TSA, all this recording equipment looks like small tripods, a taser, yeah. everything yeah, yeah, else. Yeah, yeah. The, the microphones look really dense. They look, I usually position myself so I could see the security person's face when my thing goes through, yeah. the, uh, through the, the, the screen so that they can... What is that? But the best line I got was um, to T uh, uh, TSA people scanning. And they said, sir, are you a hip hop artist? <laughs> now, I know this is not, you know, a video podcast, but it should be relatively obvious. I am not a hip hop artist by any means. But they sir, can we just say you are? I'm like, sure. Feel feel free. But, you know, <laughs> uh, going through immigration at San Francisco Airport about 20 years ago. And a very officious, I say. And what do you do in London? Staring at me malevolently. And I said, well, actually, I'm a cartoonist. Hey, you're a cartoonist. That's great. You should draw that guy over there. Points to one of his colleagues. He's a complete fucking joke. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, thank you very much. I'll go my way. Now. Career nice advice. Day. Thank you. That's, that's good. <laughs> yeah, Mimi Pond in her new comic, uh, uh, cartoonist in Southern California, uh, has a story back in the 70s where she's being beaten up by Coke dealers who are in the wrong house. Uh, they, they think she's her next door neighbor mm. who they're trying to get money out of um, when she finally says, stop hitting me. I'm a cartoonist. And they all stop. Have we seen your stuff? There's three Colombians. And she's like, I'm in the Sacramento. She had, happened to have yeah. a copy on the, the stand. They're like, Oh man. Yeah. We love your stuff. And they stop beating her to death yeah, yeah. and go over next door to take care well, of the, I'll just the neighbor. Tell you, tell you two uh, brief stories. Uh, probably finish up on um, one is about Giles, the great, British cartoonist was a staple of Sundays in this country for about 30 years. He used to do stuff in the Sunday Express, and it was, he had the famous Giles family of um, dysfunctional people. And he was just sort of, you know, cosy suburban. But he was also, he previously been a member of the Communist Party, and he was actually quite a lot of rage in there. And he'd also been a war cartoonist, and he was present at the liberation of Dachau. And they were in the Commandant's office surrounded by piles of corpses and there's Giles little bloke drawing away in the corner and the commandant says who's that over there oh that's Carl Giles he's our uh, he's our war cartoon oh my god you're Carl Giles I love your work you're so great and he gives him his SS dagger he gives him his Luger says send me one of your originals please and as Giles commented afterwards rather laconically 
I never did send him an original because they hanged him at Nuremberg. Yeah. <laughs> like, what do you want? So I to saved do? a stamp. <laughs> <laughs> and the other story is um, uh, a few years ago, I was part of a um, panel of cartoonists judging a, a Turkish cartoon competition, which no longer exists because the people who organise it are in prison, for Christ's sake. Anyway, um, amongst the other judges were a very nice Israeli cartoonist and his best mate, who was a Palestinian cartoonist called Baha Bukhari, who sadly is now dead. Died a few years ago, I think, you know, old age, basically, which is good for him. But he'd worked for Fatah papers for decades and he'd followed um, the PLO around its diaspora around the Middle East as they got kicked out from one country after another. And they were in Kuwait at one point where they'd found refuge. And uh, there was, he had a knock on the door in the middle of the night and uh, there were men with guns who said, you come with us now. They put a hood on his head, put him in the car, drive him out to the desert. He thinks, oh, fuck, I'm going to die. I'm, this time I really am going to die. And they get him out of the car, take the hood off his head, and there is this Dallas-style ranch in the middle of the desert, surrounded by men with guns. They take him inside. In the lobby, there is a Bedouin tent, surrounded by men with guns. They take him into the tent. In the tent, there are men with guns. And this, this man comes in, this sheikh comes in, who is the brother of a Kuwaiti minister. And Baha thinks, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. And this man screams at him, Are you the cartoonist who drew my brother last week? And there's no point lying. He said, Yes, I am. Why haven't you drawn me? <laughs> <laughs> so he draws him quickly and gets away. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and and he, at, the, at the time of this, we were judging this cartoon competition, uh, Baha had just been sentenced in absentia to 10 years in prison by the Hamas government in Gaza. For the, way he'd drawn, for the way he'd drawn the head of Hamas's beard, who said this was worse than the Danish cartoons. <laughs> and I said, how do you feel like, how do you feel about that? Because he lived in, in Ramallah, on the West Bank. He said, for the first time in my life, I'm grateful for the existence of the State of Israel, because it's in the way. <laughs> <laughs> Martin, thanks so much for coming on the show. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> That was Martin Rosen. You can check out his editorial cartoons in The Guardian, The Tribune, uh, The Daily Mirror, etc. You should follow him on Twitter at Martin Rosen. I'm going to find out where all of his stuff appears. And that's M-A-R-T-I-N-R-O-W-S-O-N. And definitely check out those literary adaptations we were talking about, uh, Tristram Shandy, Gulliver's Travels, Wasteland, uh, as well as his other books and the collections of his strips. You can search them out on Amazon and order them at your favorite bookstores. Not everything is in print in the U.S. Uh, some stuff fell out of print. Some stuff hasn't been published here. But you can find them in used bookstores or at Abe Books, whatever your, your preferred choice of, of finding tough-to-find books is. Now, once we wrapped up the main session, I asked Martin, so, who are you reading? And if you want to hear his answer to that, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memory Show so you can get access to our quarterly bonus podcast, Beer of a Square Planet. The newest episode of that went up just this week with extra material from guests like Howard Chaikin, Joyce Farmer, Ben Schwartz, Ellen Forney, Matt Ruff, Patty Farmer, Sven Burkertz, Gordon Van Gelder, Ellen Datlow, Kathy Bidas, John Clute, Mimi Pond, and Matt Worker, another editorial cartoonist. You can get access by supporting the show at patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. There are all sorts of goals and goodies in place for patrons, including that podcast, patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode, the series of ebooks that someday I'll get around to launching, and more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. Now, I recorded this one at Martin's home in London. That trip cost me a few hundred bucks. It was kind of appended on to a business trip to Frankfurt, so I didn't have to pay for too much of the air travel. Um... And I stayed with John and Judith Clute, so I didn't have to spend money on a hotel either. Still, lots of travel on the tube, a uh, couple of meals, still not too pricey a trip. If you want to help defray some of the costs of the virtual memory show, like web hosting, travel, equipment, coffee, uh, or just toss me some money because you think the show is worth it, then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. A special thanks go out to Kevin Katila, John Wendler, Fred Kish, 
Jonathan Kranz, Stephen Nadler, Wallace Wilde Manozzi, Andrew Mason, Greg Tanner, Garrett Zecker, Craig P. Steffen, Jack Les Camella, and Ron Slate for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories Show. We've got the full list of show supporters at chimeraobscura.com slash vm. Our music for this episode is Nothing's Gonna Bring Me Down by David Bayerwald, used with permission from the artist. And that's it for this week's Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week, probably with Nicholas Del Banco, but we haven't recorded that one yet, so I can't promise anything. So if it doesn't happen, we'll have Israeli author Eshkal Nevo, who I recorded with last week and definitely have in the can. It was the same evening I got to meet Joel Gray at a book launch party. I'll tell you about that one some other time. Now, until next time, you can subscribe to the Virtual Memory Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store or at soundcloud.com slash vmspod. You can also find all our episodes and get in our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at facebook.com slash Show at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, again, please go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and review. That'll help us build a bigger audience. Till next time, you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you are awesome. Keep it that way. Mm-hmm.